forces that went to war in August 1914, none was so well equipped with artillery as was the German. German army doctrine at the time envisaged artillery playing a fundamental role in breaking the enemy's line. The German artillery arm was to remain forcefully impressive throughout the conflict, introducing many new designs during its course. The strength of the German artillery arm was seen at Verdun and in the opening barrages of the spring offensives of 1918. This effectiveness was not lost on the Entente powers who, in June 1919, in the Treaty of Versailles, moved to drastically reduce the artillery of the new truncated Reichswehr of 100,000 men. The Allies moved to constrain the ability of the Krupp and Rhine metal combines to produce new guns, severely limiting the calibre and number they could produce. Krupp was restricted to calibres above 17 centimetres and Rhine metal to below that figure. As with other forbidden research on new weapons, these companies shifted their design teams abroad to undertake such work in secret. Krupp's and Rheinmetall were extremely well placed to respond to the secret decision taken by Adolf Hitler in early 1933 to break the Versailles Treaty and begin rebuilding the German armed forces. The ambitions of Germany's new leader required a massive expansion in the types of guns and in the quantity of artillery needed. While many of the artillery types that were to see service throughout the war were already designed and in the process of being placed into production, the design teams in both companies now turned their fertile minds to addressing new challenges. Contracts were placed in rapid order by the government for a whole gamut of artillery types, ranging from the small infantry gun right through to the heavy rail guns. Contracts were also let to other companies to produce shells and manufacture the explosives and propellant charges for them. Other matters of related concern to the development of an expanded artillery arm were the production of new prime movers. One, three, five, eight, twelve and eighteen ton half-tracks, all of which would play their role in towing the new guns for the army. The army had determined to standardise on a few basic calibres quite early on in the 30s. By the middle of the decade, the 75mm infantry gun, SIG 33, 105mm field howitzer and the 150mm heavy howitzer, FLAC and 37mm anti-tank guns were already in large-scale production and finding their way in ever-increasing numbers to the Wehrmacht. Krupps were also producing very heavy guns to support the Navy's building programme. Many for warships that were never built because of the onset of the war would find their way into the army's control in due course. Small wonder that unemployment rapidly dropped in Germany following the massive investment by the state in the rearmament program. The only problem for the army was that it banked on a short war. Once Hitler publicly renounced the Treaty of Versailles and announced the rebuilding of Germany's armed forces, he could not resist flaunting their growing power in public displays designed to both awe and intimidate. Pride of place in these displays went to the big guns whose size made them very potent symbols of the growing might of the Wehrmacht. Within a short time, these same weapons would be pounding armies and cities from the deserts of North Africa to the cold and desperate snowy wastes of northern Russia. These were not artillery pieces designed for show, they were meant for war. The term infantry gun was employed by the German army for those weapons designed and issued specifically for service with infantry formations. Like many of the artillery weapons used by the German army in the Second World War, the 75mm light infantry gun 18 was designed before the Nazis came to power in 1933. Its origins lay in the years following World War I, when the Reichswehr was absorbing the lessons of that conflict. One of these was that infantry needed a light artillery piece to move forward in their advance to give them close support when dealing with enemy defences. This weapon was first issued in 1927 and was still seeing widespread service in 1945, even though by that date it was being supplanted by heavy mortars in infantry units. The IG-18 saw service on all fronts and in all theatres wherever German infantry were engaged. The 
Its light, small design saw it readily adapted for use by mounted troops. The design employed a simple shotgun type breech, which allowed infantry to maintain a very rapid rate of fire, as can be seen in this film of these guns being used in North Africa in 1941. had an elevation from minus 10 degrees through to plus 75 degrees. At its most extreme elevation, the IG-18 could deliver effective plunging fire. Maximum range depended on ammunition type, but it was possible for it to shoot out to a maximum of 3,880 yards. The gun was pulled either by horse or towed by light trucks or one-ton half-tracks. The SIG-33 was the largest and heaviest of the German infantry guns. Although the designation SIG-33 suggests it came into service in 1933, it did in fact enter service with the Reichswehr in the same year alongside the IG-18. With a calibre of 150mm, the SIG-33 saw service throughout the conflict, although it was confined to operations in Europe and Russia. It did not serve in North Africa. The reason has primarily to do with the fact that it was a horse-drawn weapon and no horses were employed by the German army in that theatre. It was well liked as a stable and effective artillery piece. Its principal disadvantage lay in its heavy weight, which was excessive for an infantry support weapon. Attempts to reduce this by employing alloys instead of steel on certain components on the chassis came to naught with the onset of the war and the priority allocation of such metals to aircraft manufacture. The range of the weapon differed accordingly to the charge loaded with each shell. A standard heavy explosive shell could have a range from 615 yards through to a maximum of 5,140 yards. The rate of fire was between two and three rounds per minute. The SIG-33 had the distinction of being the first artillery piece placed on a self-propelled mount when 38 of these guns were adapted to fit a modified Panzer I and were delivered to the German army between 1939 and 1940. The gun was also mounted on the Panzer II, Panzer III and 38T chassis. Seeing service in all theatres and on fronts where the German army served, the 105mm light field howitzer 18 was the standard artillery equipment at divisional level. It predated Hitler's coming to power, having been designed by Rheinmetall in the period 1929-1930. A number of years were to elapse before it entered service with the German army in 1935. It rapidly came to supersede and then replace the Army's former weapon of that calibre, the FH-16, that had been designed by Krupp during the First World War. The design, although modified, was to remain in service and production through to 1945. It was well thought of by those who operated it. Its principal virtue was that its crews found the weapon easy to operate and manoeuvre. Its split trail design allowed it to be manhandled quickly, as can be seen in this film. One of its primary virtues was that it was extremely reliable. This was especially important after 1941 when the climatic extremes in the Soviet Union required that weapons work on demand when the temperatures were in the high 40s centigrade or many degrees below zero. The gun could be depressed to an angle of minus 6 degrees and elevated to a maximum of plus 40. Range, as with most weapons, was dependent upon the power of the charge used. With a maximum powder charge, the F-18 could fire a 32-pound high-explosive shell out to 11,675 yards or 10,675 metres.
Here in North Africa, FH-18s are being employed in the anti-tank role for which they were equipped with a special shell. The original 10cm Panzer Granat shell was later replaced by the more effective 10cm Panzer Granat Red shell. Either can reach a maximum range of 1,640 yards and penetrate the frontal armor of many Allied tanks. The desperate winter of 1941-42 in Russia saw the divisional light artillery challenged by ferocious conditions of weather and an implacable foe. Having been caught by the Soviet winter, which in 1941 was the worst for some 50 years, artillery crews had to contend with bitter cold. Lacking proper winter clothing and wearing only their greatcoats, these 105mm gun crews had to load and fire their guns day after day. As with its heavier stable bank, the 150mm howitzer, the Achilles heel of the FH-18 was its lack of mobility. Most of these guns were towed by horse teams and only a few by the three-ton half-tracks. The Army was most concerned to give this well-proven gun greater mobility. The growing obsolescence of the Panzer II light tank released many of the surviving chassis for conversion to self-propelled guns. In early 1942, the firm of Alke produced the Vespa. This was a self-propelled gun mounted the 105mm LH-18. This machine went into production in the same year, with 676 produced by July 1944. Most other 105mm guns were still towed in the same old fashion, with film of them being pulled by horses still being seen in 1945. The effectiveness of the 105mm can be measured by the manner in which many served alongside the larger 150mm howitzer, as is seen here. Artillery proved especially important in the savage winter of 1941-42. The Germans held on to villages to gain shelter from the terrible cold, while Soviet assaults were directed to destroy any building in which the Germans could find such cover. German artillery, however, proved highly effective in destroying these Russian assaults. or days before the Allied landings there. The late model LH-18s mounted a muzzle brake to permit the gun to fire shells of greater power and range. 105mm batteries were employed in ever heavier firefights between the mid-summer of 1943 and war's end on the Eastern Front. The desperate attempts by the Germans to hold back the ever-growing Soviet offensive tide saw them in continual use from the Ukraine through to the outskirts of Leningrad. By late 1944, the Germans had been pushed back into Poland and East Prussia. The 105mm light howitzer saw service literally up to war's end. The backbone of the German medium artillery formations throughout the war was the 15cm Schwer field howitzer, or SFH-18. 
It was developed and produced in parallel with the heavy 10 cm cannon, which employed the same carriage, but is distinguishable by its shorter barrel. Both weapons were developed by Ryan Mattal and Crook in the late 1920s for the Reichswehr and entered service in the period 1933-34. However, the army became rapidly disillusioned with the 10 cm weapon and focused upon the 15 cm calibre, which saw service throughout the war. Another version of the same calibre, known as the FH-36, was ordered by the army as early as 1935, and this was distinguished by being lighter, as it used alloys in place of steel in some parts of the carriage. The distinguishing feature of this model is the muzzle brake. With the onset of war and the allocation of most metal alloys to aircraft manufacture, the production of the FH-36 was limited and discontinued in 1942. The 15cm SFH-18 is seen in almost all films shot in the German army in war, from the first to the last days of the conflict. It was transported by horse and also moved in the advanced echelons of the army by being towed behind an eight-ton half-track. These seen in action here are involved in the first months of Operation Barbarossa. It was the ability to rapidly move heavy artillery and keep it in striking distance of the panzer spearheads that allowed advanced tank formations to call upon heavy artillery support when faced with obstacles it was unable to remove. Having such weapons close to the moving front was also discovered to be psychologically most effective. The performance of this 15 cm gun was as always dependent upon the charge and shell type. The standard high explosive shell weighed some 43 and a half kilograms. When propelled by a single bagged charge, its range was some 4,000 yards. When employing the maximum charge, the gun's range was boosted to over 14,000 yards. Attempts to increase the range of this weapon even further saw the tentative introduction of the world's first rocket boosted shell in 1941. It could only be employed on guns with muzzle brakes and had a theoretical maximum range of over 20,000 yards or 19,000 meters. It was not a success and withdrawn quite quickly. A very large number of different projectile types were developed for this weapon, including shells for employment against concrete emplacements, hollow charge shells and smoke shells. German artillery arms suffered exceptionally heavy losses in the years 1941-42 during the course of the campaign in Russia. Many hundreds of these artillery pieces were lost in the retreat from Moscow and in the 1942 summer offensive culminating in the defeat of the 6th Army of Stalingrad. By the time of the Battle of Kursk in July 1943, the artillery arm was less well placed than the tank arm. Indeed, air power had to substitute for the lack of large numbers of German heavy artillery in this battle. By this date, it was also becoming apparent to the army that the Achilles heel of this weapon lay in its inability to be moved rapidly unless it was towed by a prime mover. Even then, the weather conditions in Russia were such that after rain or during the muddy season, even half-tracks found it difficult to tow such heavy guns. 15 centimetre weighing in at about five and a half tons. In 1942 the decision had been taken to mount this gun on a fully tracked chassis to give it the desired mobility. The subsequent Hummel or Bumblebee employed a Panzer 3-4 chassis to carry the gun in an open mount. Some of the most impressive artillery pieces fielded by the German army in World War II and encountered in all theatres were the 17 and 21 centimetre very heavy guns. Both employed the same chassis and are distinguishable by virtue of their barrel lengths. 
Although large and heavy pieces, their clever design enabled them to be manhandled fairly easily in the field. Although transportation involved breaking down the guns and carrying them on two separate chassis. The barrel was towed by one half-track and the body of the gun by another. Twelve-ton half-tracks were normally used for this task. First of the two weapons to appear was the 21cm model, which was introduced by Krupp in 1939. The gun was allocated to the motorised artillery units of the army. At the time of the Russian campaign, 19 batteries had been raised and they saw extensive service on the Eastern Front. Although it proved highly effective in demolishing strongly defended and protected targets, its heavy weight of just over 16 tons had led the army to decide to replace it by the 17cm cannon. This had nearly twice the range of the 21cm model. It was planned to phase out production of the 21cm gun in June 1942, after 487 had been built. However, such was the scale of losses in this calibre of weapon that the 21cm was retained and production was increased through 1943 and 44. and by March 1945 there were still 218 in service. The 21cm model had an elevation of between 0 and 70 degrees and a maximum range of over 16,000 metres. The standard shell for the type was the 21cm Granat 18, which weighed 113 kilograms, and also the 21cm Granat 18 Beton of 121 kilograms. This was a projectile specially designed for demolishing concrete emplacements and a well-trained crew could fire one round every two minutes from this weapon. The 17cm weapon named the Matterhorn was introduced into service in 1941. The Army's original criticism of the 21cm was that it was too heavy, was not in any way alleviated by the introduction of the Matterhorn. It weighed in at 17 and a quarter tons. Its method of carriage was essentially the same, although it was possible to tow it over short distances a limber without splitting up the barrel from the chassis. The range of the 17cm was determined by the size and power of the case charge. Maximum range with a charge 4, which then imparted a muzzle velocity of some 3,000 feet per second to the 138 pound high explosive projectile, allowed it to reach over 32,000 yards. The 21 and the 17cm often served alongside one another. Far away, the bulk of these weapons were committed to service in the east, where they operated in some numbers in the siege of Leningrad through the Crimea. Although associated with the Great War, artillery spotting balloons operated in the quieter sectors of the Eastern Front. This was possible because the Soviet Air Force was not so prominent in the skies over Russia, so the balloons could be used without fear of being shot down. Employing information radio down from the balloon, coordinates are worked out and fed to the gun team. There were occasions when K-18 and K-21s were employed alongside flak 88s and 150mm artillery pieces and not just operated by themselves. Dating from the autumn of 1943, this sequence shows a 21cm Mirza operating alongside 150mm heavy artillery, 105mm medium guns and flak 88s in the Dniper Bend in southern Russia. Fire support is provided by the artillery as Panzers and SPWs prepare to advance against Soviet armour in the distance. In these circumstances, the power of the 21cm gun could match the range of the 88s and bring down an especially heavy weight of fire on the enemy. However, the artillery pieces themselves are indeed a protection from Soviet ground attack aircraft. 
the more remarkable German heavy artillery designs was the 24cm Cannon III, also nicknamed the Petersdorf. Designed and built between 1935 and 1938, it was a most advanced and modern design. However, its Achilles heel lay in its weight. At 83 tons, it needed to be transported in no fewer than six separate loads. Although the designers had taken great care to allow it to be assembled easily, it still needed no fewer than 25 men in one and a half hours to get the gun assembled for firing. The army decided that the investment in such a weapon could not be justified. Seeing service throughout the war as one of the primary anti-aircraft weapons of the Wehrmacht was the 20mm Fluke Abwehr Cannon 30 and 38. The latter weapon, a development of the earlier model, served either in a single barrel or feeling form, that is, four guns put together and operated as one weapon. These cannons proved most effective in defending targets against flying aircraft at low level, right up to 5,500 feet. With a full 360 degree rapid traverse when in place on the ground and 40 degrees when used in its wheel carriage, the weapon's elevation from minus 12 to plus 90 degrees permitted a very rapid tracking of targets. Such was the versatility of this weapon that it was also extensively employed in the ground roll, where its high rate of fire of up to 280 rounds per minute on a cycling setting, in the case of the Flank 30, provided ground troops with a highly effective close support weapon. It was also mounted on one-ton half-tracks and used by the Kriegsmarine in either single-barreled or feeling form. Flak 30 was first introduced into Luftwaffe service in 1935, where it was originally towed by the Krupp Boxer Light Truck. While this gun served with distinction in the early stage of the war, the Luftwaffe had decided, even before the onset of the conflict, that it needed an improved variant with a much higher rate of fire. So the Flak 38 was raised to a maximum of 480 rounds per minute, although a more practical rate was 220 rounds to save on barrel weight. was basically a redesign of the earlier weapon. It first came into service in early 1940, in time for the Western Campaign, where it saw action alongside the Flak 30, defending the bridges over the River Meuse, being attacked by the Army de l'Air and Royal Air Force. The Flak 30 served alongside the 38 through to the mid-war period, but had all but disappeared by the later phase of the conflict. The Flak 38 saw extensive service right to the end of the war. Flak feeling emerged in late 1940 as a rapid and practical response to the Luftwaffe's need to get more ammunition into the air to raise the probability of affecting the kill of a target. Mounting four Flak 38s on one mount enabled the combined rate of fire from all four barrels to be raised to a maximum of some 1,900 rounds per minute. However, a more practical rate so as to enhance barrel life saw this come down to around 7 to 800 rounds per minute. The flat feeling was employed alongside the larger 37mm and 88mm flat guns in the aerial defence of Germany. By 1944, the Luftwaffe had come to the conclusion that 20mm was too small a calibre to be effective against the aircraft being deployed by the Allies and the Russians. It was this realisation that led Hitler to refuse production of the Flak Panzer IV Mobile Wagen in 1944 as being a waste of a tank chassis for such a purpose because of the perceived inadequacy of the Flak Feeling 38 that was slated to be its primary weapon. The Flak Feeling was an extremely versatile weapon and was also extensively employed in the ground role. 
deploying armour-piercing ammunition, it could defeat soft skins, armoured cars and thinly armoured light tanks. The flat feeling was also mounted on trucks and on the eight-ton half truck. The Greens Marine also extensively employed the weapon on its warships. Luftwaffe practice was frequently to group different calibers of flak weapons when employed on anti-aircraft duties in order to cover different altitudes. The United States Army Air Force P-38 Lightnings and P-47 Thunderbolts engaged on ground attack missions are seen here being fired upon by single-barrel 20mm cannons, flak veerlings and a number of 37mm flak abwehr cannon. By this stage of the war, the Luftwaffe was beginning to concentrate on the 37mm as its smallest flak weapon, deeming the 20mm no longer up to the task. Examples of the 37mm flak weapon in its different variants is not at all common in film of this period. The calibre first entered service in 1935 and appeared in a number of different variants by war's end. The original Flak 18 was quickly replaced by the Flak 36 and 37, which was the most common variant used in action. As with the 20mm weapon, the 37mm was used extensively in the ground roll, being equipped with an armour-piercing shell for that purpose. The 88mm Flak gun and its different variants was the most famous of all artillery pieces employed by the Wehrmacht in the Second World War. Indeed, it was, in all probability, the most famous, if not infamous, artillery piece of the entire conflict. While this reputation was certainly cultivated by very assiduous propaganda, it is nevertheless the case that it was an exceptionally versatile weapon, being employed in the anti-aircraft, anti-tank role, and as conventional artillery with equal ability. Its reputation amongst Germany's enemies was notorious. There is a famous story originally published in the US Stars and Stripes which dates from the fall of Tunisia in 1943 and shows a US intelligence officer interrogating German prisoners. He assures a GI standing near and observing the process, don't worry if I find the one what invented the 88, I'll let you know. It was the mounting of this weapon in its modified and developed forms that made the Tiger I and Tiger II tanks Nashhorn tank destroyers, such formidable armoured fighting vehicles. It was Goering's abiding faith in the effectiveness of the 88 in the anti-aircraft role that led him to claim that no enemy aircraft would ever penetrate the airspace of the Reich. Although effective in this role, it is clear that the 88mm was actually no better than its allied contemporaries, such as the British 3.7-inch anti-aircraft gun, which had a better performance in sealing, weight of shell and also ground range. It was in the Western Desert that the 88 began to acquire its fearsome reputation in the anti-tank role. Its first appearance in this theatre was noted outside of Tobruk in April 1941. Towed by an eight-ton half-track, the 88 was frequently employed in the anti-tank role while still on its real cruciform chassis. Its principal disadvantage then lay in its height, which was some 6 feet 10 inches. In the desert, its greatest effectiveness in the anti-tank role came when its crews had time to dig gun pits. Whilst these had to be large, the gun then became, in the words of a British report, extremely difficult to detect at 1,000 yards range. The fortuitous decision to equip the 88mm with armor-piercing ammunition and practical direct first sights dates back to the time of the Spanish Civil War, when the initial model of the 88, the Flak 18, was tested in action for the first time. The primary armor-piercing shell contained a small charge to explode after penetration. Armor plate up to 108mm thick could be penetrated at up to 1,100 yards. The gun's ability to penetrate armor of such thickness and in such a range not only made any British tank in the desert vulnerable, it made the 88mm the only weapon easily able to deal with the formidable new T-34 and KV series of heavy tanks when encountered in Russia in 1941. The 
1948 was also frequently employed in the conventional artillery role. These Waffen-SS troopers are serving their pieces in southern Russia in the late summer of 1943. Albert Speer, Hitler's industrial minister, was later to claim that the sheer quantity of resources retained in Germany to defend it from the US and British bomber offensive constituted the Second Front a long time before the Allied landings in France. Indeed, by the autumn 1943, the need to protect the cities of Germany had seen an extremely large concentration of anti-aircraft weapons, which could have been better employed on the battlefields in Russia and elsewhere. By October 1943, no fewer than 23 heavy batteries, amounting to some 138mm guns, were ringing the city of Schweinfurt. By war's end, no fewer than 30 anti-aircraft divisions were protecting Germany. Eighty-eight batteries provided a defensive umbrella for German and Italian forces retreating from Sicily across the Straits of Messina in August 1943. The barrage thrown up by the German batteries, expending a prodigious amount of ammunition, allowed no fewer than 102,000 troops to be slipped across the Straits in the face of Allied bombing raids. encountered the 88 throughout the Italian campaign. As the Germans often emplaced their guns in well-prepared defensive positions, the 88 once more emerged as a formidable weapon. From Salerno through to Casino, the Germans used their 88s to delay the Allied advance. It was in the fighting around the Great Monastery in early 1944 that film of 88 shooting at Allied Sherman tanks was taken. The 88 often proved to be the nemesis of this Allied tank, which by this date and through to war's end was to constitute the primary weapon in the Allied tank forces. The frontal armour of the Sherman was vulnerable to penetration to the 88 from some considerable distance. Whether encountered as an artillery piece or when mounted on tanks and self-propelled guns, this particular weapon was to prove exceedingly dangerous to all Allied AFVs. Given its effectiveness, it would be perfectly reasonable to suppose that the 88mm Flak 18 was actually a very new design. In fact, it can be traced back to 1925, and although Krupp and Rheinmetall did experimental work in Germany, much of the design was undertaken by Germans seconded to work at the Bofors factory in Sweden. A prototype was then built in Germany, and the gun entered service in 1933. It was bloodied in the Spanish Civil War and was most successful. In this sequence, 88mm Flak 36 provide air cover to German ground forces in Western Russia in 1944. By that period, the Soviets had local air superiority wherever the Red Air Force chose to fly. So the provision of large numbers of flak weapons of different calibers became essential for the Germans. The ground forces here are under attack by Ilushin II Sturmovics. Although German forces had been driven from the Caucasus following their failed attempt to secure the oil fields there in the 1942 summer campaign, Hitler had insisted on retaining a large bridgehead in the Cuban Peninsula. When the military situation improved, he intended to make a second attempt to secure this vital economic resource. Until that time, the Cuban bridgehead, known as the Goat and Calf or Goat's Head position, had to be constantly resupplied across the Kirk Straits. This arterial route was naturally a prime target for the Soviet Air Force. In consequence, the Germans had ringed the port on the Cuban side with extremely dense, light and heavy flank defences, and it is these that are seen in action here. On this occasion, IL-2 Sturmvicks engaged in medium and low-level strikes on the port facilities. 
20mm and 88mm flat guns provide a heavy barrage which takes its toll on a number of the Soviet aircraft. Rare sequence of the Soviet air attack on a German air and seaplane base in northern Norway in 1943 is met by heavy anti-aircraft fire from light 20 mm flak with a battery of the ubiquitous 88 mm guns. The sequence is effective in showing the communications link between the range-finding team and the gun layers. The relevant information on height, distance, and so forth is relayed by radio to gunners who then target the Soviet attackers and fire the guns. Once again, the 88s are successful and they bring down one of the Soviet attackers. Following the destruction of much of Army Group Center and the pushing back of Army Group North in the late summer of 1944, the Germans found themselves fighting extremely heavy battles with the Soviets. In this excellent sequence showing 88mm flaks operating in the anti-tank role with support from light flak, oncoming Soviet armour is targeted. Flak 36 remained able to counter any Soviet medium and heavy tank right up to war's end. In the face of almost total Allied air supremacy over the Normandy battlefield from June through to August 1944, the Luftwaffe could only give succor to the German army by the employment of extremely large numbers of flak batteries. Frequently, flak weapons were grouped in a sector and were of different types. 20mm single-barreled, feelings, 37mm and 88mm are here grouped together to offer the most effective air umbrella to the ground defences. Such vast numbers of Allied aircraft that even flak in such concentrations could do little to dent the Allied ability to target German ground forces. Nevertheless, Allied losses were not light, and the German guns brought down many aircraft. Camouflage was mandatory, for Allied ground attack aircraft themselves targeted the flak guns, and as these were unable to move in daylight, were thus vulnerable to bombing. Seen here is a graphic illustration of the effectiveness of flak in dealing with slow-moving four-engined aircraft operating without fighter escort and at low level. RAF Stirlings are seen engaged in new supply flights to surrounding British paratroops in and around the Bridge at Arnhem. Because of the contracting defensive perimeters, they need to fly very low over the target area in order to try and ensure their supplies reach the trapped British paras. As such, they're sitting ducks. The 36 was the standard German anti-tank gun when war broke out in September 1939. At the time of its introduction three years earlier, this rhine metal designed weapon was as good as any other in the world and perfectly acceptable for its role as it was then envisaged. While service in Poland did little to cause the German army to question its effectiveness, its poor performance in the Western campaign against the heavily armoured French Char B and the British Matilda II tanks led to the ordinary trooper labelling it the Army's door knocker. It was extremely disconcerting for the crews of the Pack 36 to observe the shell from the Army's standard anti-tank gun simply bounce off the heavy armour of these machines. This was compounded by a repeat experience when in June 1941 the Germans first encountered the Soviet T-34 and KV-1. In both cases, the armor-piercing shells of the Pack 36 once more simply bounced off the heavy armor of the Soviet tanks. After this, its days as an anti-tank gun were numbered, even though it was more than adequate for dealing with the Soviet BT and T series of tanks. The 
Hack 36 remained in service for many years, often being employed by infantry as a light artillery piece. Installation of an anti-tank grenade also extended its usefulness. It was also Rheinmetall who produced the 50mm Pack 38 anti-tank gun, which entered limited service in 1940. A number were on hand for the onset of the Russian campaign, where even they had difficulty coping with the new Soviet tanks. The Pack 38 was a well-designed weapon and served alongside its heavier stablemate, the Pack 40, until war's end. The most commonly encountered and effective purpose-designed German anti-tank gun encountered on all fronts from late 1941 onwards was the 75mm Pack 40. Although both Krupp and Rheinmetall responded to the Army's contract, it was the latter's weapon that became the mainstay of the anti-tank arm. One of the more unusual sequences of film dating from 1943 illustrates a Pack 40 being towed by horses ridden by Cossacks. These famed riders of the steppe served in some numbers with the Wehrmacht, and it was their expertise with these animals that saw them pulling this anti-tank gun in this fashion. On most occasions, the Pack 40 was towed by a half-track or Raupenschlepper. The Pack 40 was, in essence, an enlarged Pack 38. It was an extremely effective weapon with a muzzle velocity of 2,600 feet per second that enabled it to penetrate 116 millimeters of armor at 1,000 meters. It was the answer German anti-tank gun was needed on the Eastern Front, with the T-34 and KV series proving vulnerable to the time. It was found mounted on a number of self-propelled guns and also employed as a light artillery piece. Nicknamed the Barn Door by troops who used it by virtue of its heavy weight and cumbersome size, the 88mm Pack 4341 was nevertheless a highly effective weapon. Russia stated that it could defeat Soviet T 34s up to 3,300 yards. Here is a rare shot of a Pack 41 in the anti tank. With the beginning of rearmament in Germany in 1933, interest was revived in rail guns. Germany had built a number of these weapons in the Great War, many employing modified barrels adapted from large caliber naval guns. Krupp was the home of these guns, and a small staff of 200 involved on their design at the beginning of 1933 quickly rose to 2,000. In the six years before war broke out, the Germans built a number of new weapons, from between 15 centimetres and 28 centimetres. The largest railgun ever built was the 80 centimetre Dora, which was completed in 1942. Most railway guns were used for long range bombardments of special targets. The influence of First World War design was clearly apparent in the 24 centimetre railgun known as Theodore Bruno. Although begun in 1936, Many of its features drew heavily on the design of an artillery piece dating to 1910. The Army placed an order for six of these weapons and all were delivered by 1939. These were deployed in four batteries in May 1940. The Theodore Bruno fired a number of projectiles, but a standard high explosive shell weighing some 327 pounds could achieve a maximum range of 22,091 yards when employing a full charge. Field Marshal Albert Kesselring, commander of German forces in Italy, observes the fall of shot of the 28cm cannon known as Leopold, and immortalised by the Allies within the Anzio bridgehead as Anzio Annie. More properly designated the 28cm K5E, this weapon is generally regarded as one of the finest railway guns ever built. Design of this new type began in 1934, with the first entering service in 1936. Such was the effectiveness of the type that it was retained in very low volume production through to 1945, by which time Krupp had built 28, although the complete order was for 30. 
By May 1940, there were eight 24 centimeter guns in service, and these were deployed in eight batteries. This caliber of weapon was eventually to comprise almost half of all the German rail guns. In total, the gun weighed 218 tons and was mounted on two six axle bogey trucks. The barrel length was 21 and a half meters and its maximum range 62 kilometers. The greatest concentration of rail guns and super heavy guns and mortars ever deployed by the Germans for one operation occurred in the late spring and early summer of 1942 in Russia. They were brought out especially from Germany to pulverize the defenses of the Soviet Black Sea fortress of Sevastopol in the Crimea. The largest of the rail guns brought in for the task was the gigantic 80 centimeter Dora. Weighing in at a modest 1,350 tons, it saw its only service at Sevastopol and later at Warsaw in 1944. shortly after his appointment to oversee the strengthening of the defences on Hitler's much vaunted Atlantic Wall and his Festung Europa. For long the subject of German propaganda films, the wall was claimed to be impregnable. What Rommel found, however, was something very much less than that. In certain stretches, much effort had been made and these sectors were particularly strong in emplaced artillery and heavy coastal guns. Indeed, all German coastal defences were often a remarkable mixture of various calibres of different German and many captured artillery pieces in large and purpose-designed coastal guns. The latter were in many cases adapted naval guns, ran in calibres from packed 40 75mm anti-tank guns adapted to a fixed naval mounting, through to the massive 40.6cm guns originally intended for the never-built H-class battleships. The larger weapons derived from naval vessels made armaments required purpose-built and extremely heavily protected concrete emplacements. These were without doubt most impressive installations and not surprisingly were often filmed in such a way as to imply that the whole of the Atlantic War was festooned with such weapons. In the weeks following the Allied invasion of Normandy, German audiences were regaled with scenes showing the heavy guns of the Atlantic War firing on Allied vessels. The reality was more prosaic. Having landed where the Germans did not expect, the guns never got the chance to fire in anger. The images seen here of Allied vessels being sunk are simply the creation of the propagandist mind. <laughs>